Welcome to the Sufi Heart Podcast with Omid Safi, featuring teachings and stories from the wisdom of the Islamic tradition. Omid invites you to a meditation on the transformative power of love and recalling the necessity of healing our own hearts through healing the world. If you'd like to support Omid's podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com forward slash Omid. Hello, this is Omid Safi. I want to welcome you back to the Sufi Heart podcast on Be Here Now. Today, we are going to be talking about a delicate issue, the commercialization and marketization of spirituality. For many of us who work to dive into the spiritual traditions of humanity and to share it with the wider public, uh, these are issues that one has to navigate with thoughtfulness and consideration and integrity. On one hand, there is always that desire to make sure that what we do is accessible to people, available, and that as much as possible, People are not turned away um, simply because they might not have the means of obtaining the platforms whereby those teachings are provided. That's the reason why, for example, I do this Sufi Heart podcast, so that as long as you have access to the internet, you can click a few buttons and listen to these programs. At the same time, you also have to make sure that people's time and expertise is um, addressed and compensated so that the work that people do becomes sustainable. Otherwise, it um, takes a backseat to everything else and the quality of what they might have to offer also becomes a second-hand level offering. Now, in the older days, things were different. Many spiritual teachers had a craft that they practiced. When you read Sufi sources, for example, you find that it was Ali the smith, uh, Fatima the seamstress. They had day jobs. And The Sufi activity that they engaged in was the craft of the heart supported by their daily craft that they practiced. Sometimes, particularly for some scholars, they might have been in a situation of receiving funding from a state that would pay for a university, pay for a madrasa, and what have you. So, These are, I think, important considerations. Um, What do you do with the fact that in a contemporary context, it seems like everyone and everything is up for sale? And that includes spiritual traditions. To some extent, there is the way in which religion and spirituality can be, has been, commodified, commercialized, so that it becomes essentially a method of, quote-unquote, happiness, fulfillment, having a richer life. Well, many spiritual traditions also teach us to detach ourselves to some extent from, if not the world itself, from worldliness, from worldly desire from that drinking of salt water that will never quench our thirst. So there is that issue of commercialization, of marketization, 
um, Cornell West puts it really beautifully. He um, uh, quotes a wonderful Wu Tang song, Cream Cash rules everything around me. Um, but it doesn't have to rule me. Everybody, everything might be up for sale, but I don't have to be for sale. It's still possible to hang on to your integrity in a world that seems to have lost its way. The other part that um, in this conversation we're going to be getting into is the equally thorny conversation about the extent to which so many of the great spiritual traditions of humanity, um, the Islamic tradition that produces Rumi and Hafez and Ibn Arabi, the Buddhist tradition, the Christian tradition, Jewish tradition, Hindu traditions, and so on, sometimes when they become subjects of a universal appeal, when friends who do not come from those particular religious backgrounds uh, start to tap into the spiritual teachings, in this case, of Islam, but it could also apply to Buddhism or Christianity or Hinduism, although it tends to be more of an issue with Eastern religions. There is a tendency to want to remove these teachings from the fertile soil that gave birth to these sages, where human beings and communities have kept these teachings alive for centuries, if not millennia, extract it from that setting, and then repackage it as something called universal mysticism. So to some extent, this has happened two important Sufi sages, Muslim luminous beings like Rumi, where they can become the subject of everyone's favorite meme, everyone's favorite Facebook quote, and Valentine's Day card. But you can read some of these popular English versions and never have to grapple with the fact that the person that we're reading was a 13th century Persian-speaking Muslim mystic who talks about his own task as unveiling the beauty of the Quran and describes him himself as the offspring of the soul of Muhammad. The offspring of the soul of Muhammad. And in fact, some of the people who have been most instrumental in popularizing the poetry of Rumi in the West, like a dear friend of mine, Coleman Barks, he says that his goal is not only to extract Rumi out of the Islamic context, but that even words like God have become so hurtful for so many people who have been hurt in institutional contexts, that rather than translating it as God, sometimes he might just translate it as beloved. Well, we want to grapple with some of these complexities. What do we do with the fact that there are thousands of references to the Quran in Rumi's writings? No one is denying that these sages luminous beings have teachings that are medicine for the whole of humanity. Can we see the universality alongside the particularity? Can we see that the universal doesn't have to come at the expense of the particular any more that in another tradition, the universality of Jesus and Jesus' teachings are connected to the context of a first century Palestinian Jewish milieu.
any more than the teachings, the universal teachings of the Buddha are tied to a South Asian context. So yes, I think this is uh, an important conversation to have. And I want to also turn this around and to remind us that in some ways the challenge is not only that the Islam has been extracted out of figures like Rumi and Hafez, but that the corollary is also true. That far too often the poetic, mystical, spiritual, and sensual dimension that figures like Rumi and Hafez, among others, represent has been extracted out of contemporary Islam. And the analogy that I sometimes give people is, when was the last time that some of us attended Friday services in a mosque in which the imam, the Muslim prayer leader, was quoting lines of poetry from Rumi or Hafez? If the imam does that, well, um, that's a wonderful testimony to their open-heartedness. But I suspect that for many people, that is not the case today. So on one hand, we have a situation of some people extracting the Islam out of the teachings of Sufism, of Islamic spirituality, of Rumi and Hafez. And on the other hand, there's a tendency to extract the mystical and the poetic and the spiritual, the allegorical and the subtle, even the humorous, out of the context of, of Islam. And we're all left poorer when these forces begin to separate out worlds that for centuries had been interwoven around one another. So the conversation that I'd like to invite you to listen to is an interview that I was uh, fortunate to have with the Aga Khan Museum. It's one of the most beautiful museums of Islamic art in the world, located in Toronto. And they have a new program um, a podcast that's called This Being Human. Uh, so this conversation is uh, shared both among the Sufi heart community and the This Being Human. Uh, if what you are interested in is having an opportunity to keep one eye on the universal teachings, of spirituality and one eye on the particular context where these teachings first were given wings to soar, I do invite you to check out some of the courses that we have online where we have more time and more detail than we do here in these podcasts. And to see those, you can go to Illuminated courses.com. We have one course on the Quran and one course on Rumi. So, friends, uh, let us now turn to the context of the conversation with our friends at the Aga Khan Museum and um, the podcast uh, friends that we have at This Being Human. And I invite you to listen. May you be well. May you be joyful, may you be at peace. My name is Abdurrahman Malik. I'm canvassing the world for the most interesting people to hear about their journeys, their work, and what it means to be alive in the world today. And perhaps nobody has captured that experience of being alive better than the 13th century Persian poet and Sufi mystic Jalaluddin Rumi in his poem, The Guest House. This 
being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. So welcome to This Being Human, a podcast inspired by Rumi's words and motivated by all those who carry that message forward in the world today. Many of these uh, stages remind us that to be human is fundamentally something that has to do with intimacy. Today, Omid Safi. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about it. The wound is the place where the light enters you. Lovers don't finally meet somewhere. They're in each other all along. You've likely heard these quotes before or seen them posted on Instagram, hung on a wall in a yoga studio, inked into someone's skin as a tattoo or read aloud to wedding guests before vows are exchanged. They are some of the most popular words of the poet many know as Rumi or Maulana Jalaluddin Muhammad Rumi, the 13th century Persian poet, scholar, and Sufi mystic. Omid Safi has spent his life studying Maulana Rumi's words and works. He's a professor at Duke University's Islamic Studies Center and a scholar on mystical Islam and Sufism. His work melds together the worlds of religion, radical love, and progressive Islam, one that draws upon the traditions of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Here's our wide-ranging conversation on Rumi, radical love, and the relevance of the revolutionary that is Dr. Martin Luther King today. Omid, salam alaikum. Thank you for being on This Being Human. Oh, alaikum salam and peace to you and to all the friends who are listening to you. And you know, our podcast is called This Being Human, and it was inspired by Coleman Barks' translation of a, um, of a poem from Molana Rumi, which he translates as, as The Guest House. Yeah, I love that poem. I love that poem very much. What, what, what do you hear in that poem? So uh, here's what I hear in that poem. You know, this being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, uh, a joy, a depression, a meanness, and, and so on. So what Molana is talking about there in this phrase, the guest house, this refers back to that old and still present Muslim and Middle Eastern, also South Asian tradition of hospitality. There were guest houses, sometimes also caravanserais, where uh, you could show up as a stranger and you could stay for three days and you didn't have to worry about paying rent or paying a hotel bill or what have you. And after three days, you know, you'd be rejuvenated and you would pick up and be on your merry way. This is how Molana talks about being generous to your own emotions. You know, we spend so much time, and rightly so, thinking about how do we as human beings behave in a way that is gracious and kind and dignified towards our fellow human beings. And ours is certainly a global age in which we are struggling with that right now. But it actually begins at home. It begins much closer. So the way that he treats it is to say, you yourself are not your emotions. You are the host of your emotions. These are your guests. So be gracious towards them. And so you can actually imagine this, you know, oh, look, here comes joy. <laughs> joy, you are one of my favorite Friends, I love it when you come to visit. Come on in, make yourself at home, stay for a day, at two days, or three, and then here's the saying, I know that this too shall pass. Right? It's one thing to say this too shall pass when you're talking about a calamity or a disease or a difficulty. Can you also be 
fully present with joy and still say, this too shall pass. And then comes sadness. Could you look at sadness and say, ah, hello, my friend. It is so good to see you, sadness. You have been one of my most faithful companions. I'm not going to fight you. So come on in, stay for a day or two or three. And I think the reason that that poem, and I'm so delighted to hear that it's the inspiration for your whole podcast, is such a powerful one, is, you know, think about so many of the great Muslim languages, Arabic, Persian, Turkish, Urdu, others. In the old days, you know, we wouldn't say to each other, what's up? (laughs) We wouldn't say to each other, you know, how's it going? We would actually ask each other, how is your hall? How is your transient state of your heart? So whether it was Kethahalika, Halishumachatore, Apkahal, or whatever the equivalent would be in other languages, there was an awareness that when we come across another human being, that they are a guest house, they have thoughts and emotions that are visiting them, but these are transient guests. And so what we would ask each other, rather than how are you, or what are you up to, like as if asking someone about the activity that they're engaged in defines who they are, we would ask each other, what guest is visiting your heart right now? I wanted to know directly from Omid what we knew about Rumi, himself, the man, the person. It's extraordinary because we actually know probably more about Molana than we do about uh, virtually any other pre-modern Muslim figure after the Prophet Muhammad. So, you know, if you want to know how he played with children in the street, we have that story. If you want to know how he treated the widow down the street from him, we have that story. If you want to know how he was in his tender and intimate relation with his wife, we have that story. If you want to know how he cheered up his son when his son was in a state of melancholy, we have that story. And then in addition, of course, we've got over 60,000 lines of exquisite poetry. And it is something of a blessing uh, and also a complication to see Rumi almost becoming a brand, as it were, in the English language. Rumi's pop culture power today is something of a dilemma for Omid. This Muslim mystic, sage, and poet whose works revolved around issues of the soul and spirituality chopped up into bite-sized, often mistranslated quotes for social media. And then on the other hand, There are also sayings and interpretations which have so little to do with Rumi, Uh, anything that the earthly historical Molana ever actually said, um, that, you know, all kinds of memes and Facebook quotes and sayings just become attributed to him. If somebody finds something beautiful, they just slap Rumi's (laughs) kind of name on it and, uh, and up it goes. Omid says much of the original meaning behind Molana Rumi's words have been watered down, warped, and divorced from its spiritual, religious, Muslim roots. So just as one example, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, uh, there's a field, I'll meet you there. And if you actually go and take a look at the original He's saying something far more radical than right doing and wrong doing. What he's saying is that there is a plane. There's an opening beyond that which we tend to think of as infidelity and faith itself. And what he means by it is that for the majority of people, we follow a religion because our parents raised us in it. Or we might even reject the faith that our parents tried to cram down our throat because it was not appealing to us. And instead, Molana says that what you have to do 
is you have to unlearn religion as a kind of inheritance that he calls that real infidelity. And you even have to go beyond the notion of a simply inherited religion in order to arrive at a faith that you know to be true in your bones. I'm fascinated about the moment you begin your journey into Maulana Rumi's works. Do, do you remember the, the first time you, you experienced them or, or came across them? Um, and, and no, because this is one of those great love stories that has no beginning and has no <laughs> end. Um, what I do know is that, you know, when I was a teenager, that I would um, read the love poetry of, of Maulana uh, and it, it spoke to me. What I didn't have at that time was a framework to really f- understand him and receive him as also being a Muslim sage. I had a sense of its literary and poetic excellence um, and its luminous way that it worked on the heart. And and I have to say that it, it has been a journey of, of decades. Today, the Rumi effect is everywhere. The band Coldplay has blasted a reading of the guest house to a stadium of thousands in Frankfurt. Quotes from Rumi are the sign-off and people's email signatures in their Twitter bios. Even Demi Moore and Deepak Chopra performed a joint reading of a Rumi poem, Desire, together. What do you make of the, of the ways in which she's being taken up today? We are living in a culture in which um, we're all love thirsty spirit thirsty, soul thirsty. So there's no doubt about the fact that so many of the people who've gone to pick up a Rumi book from the local bookstore or sharing a meme or a Facebook quote, you know, it's not because they're trying to tap into something which is an inaccurate translation. They're tapping into it because they recognize light. I think that's on one hand. And then on the other hand, I also think that for those of us, and I'm here pointing the finger and extending an invitation to ourselves, my own community, in this case, meaning Muslims, if you don't want new ageified and inaccurate translations of Rumi to become marketized, then do something with it. When was the last time we heard a line of Rumi poetry being recited in a Friday sermon. And why? Why is it that on one hand, we say, oh yes, Rumi is the best-selling poet in America. How great. And it is. It's wonderful. But why is it that the great public conversations that we have as Muslims, that this isn't even a part of the treasure box So this divorce of Rumi from his spiritual Islamic faith and background is something that, that it really goes both ways, doesn't it then? It's, it's something, it's something that's happening within pop culture and it's, it's something that, that, that's happening within Muslim communities. And that's clearly a, a, a source of concern for you. It is. It is. And you know, um, I'd been teaching Rumi's poetry for about 25 years before a first year student at the university just made this point in passing that literally made me stop the class, grab pen and paper and write it down. You know, I had given a whole lecture about the ways in which popular versions of Rumi take him out of his Muslim context and Sufi context and Persian literary context, detaching him from the Quran and the sacred hadiths of the Prophet Muhammad. And so as a result, what we get is a Rumi that is separated from Islam. And then this 18-year-old student in my class just made this brilliant point that, oh yeah, and the other tragedy is that we get an Islam that is separated from Rumi. We get to have an Islam that is largely devoid of poetics, of beauty, of mercy, of sensuality, of tenderness, and even of eroticism. 
And what what is that Islam? Omid has been teaching Rumi's poetry for over two decades now to packed lecture halls of students. He also leads what he calls spiritual tours to places like Turkey and Morocco, places with deep histories and traditions of spirituality where there's been a legacy of peaceful coexistence. These illuminated tours, as he calls them, touch on everything from colonialism to calligraphy. They're open to both Muslims and non-Muslims, anyone who's searching for a little something more. Typically, what people say when they come to these retreats is um, that they're, they're missing love in their life, that they're looking for love, that they, they hear about it in movies and in songs or maybe even in the love poetry of Rumi. But then they say that when we look into our own life, we've never experienced it. We've never tasted it. And I think, you know, one of the things that is so healing uh, about Rumi's realization is that he tells you that there are so many different shades of love, that what we tend to think of as love, which is romantic, uh, physical, even possibly sexual love, and it's beautiful. If you have it with someone who mirrors it back to you, then mazel tov, <laughs> you know? May it, may it be, as, as our Turkish friends say, ashkolson, may it be love, let it be love. But there's also the love of a friend. There's also the love of a parent. There's also the love of a child. There's a love of a teacher. There's a love of a neighbor. There's a love of a stranger. And, you know, I think part of what Molana and all of these teachers of radical love are trying to get us to do is to uncollapse our definition of love. And then I think part of what we're intended to do in these retreats, in these conversations, is to go back and remind people that you were born in love. You have been raised in love. If you're alive today, the reason you're alive is that somebody loved you. And here we are going, you know, I don't have love in my life. Well, you know, when was the last time you called that person who loved you if she's still on earth? And if it wasn't your mama, maybe it was a grandma. Maybe it was an adopted parent. Maybe it was a teacher in first grade. So I think that's kind of what I experience in these conversations and retreats with people is that people come with a thirst And I I just keep trying to remind them that the answer that they seek is not in a person sitting in front of them. It is actually in the very ocean in which they are immersed. Hello, I am Dr. Ulrika Al-Khamis, Interim Director and CEO of the Aya Khan Museum. If you are enjoying our This Being Human podcast, why not visit our website at agakhanmuseum.org. Here you will find a treasure trove of digital connections and online resources related to the arts and achievements of the Muslim world, from historical artifacts and thought-provoking exhibitions to a wide range of educational materials and contemporary living arts performances. All of this is made possible through the vision and the dedication of Prince Amin Aga Khan and His Highness the Aga Khan himself to encourage an appreciation of the cultural threads that bind us all together. Again, our website is agakhanmuseum.org. And now, back to This Being Human. You know, there's something about the title of your latest book, Radical Love, that is really arresting. I think we live in a time when the idea of of radical has become a pejorative, um, has become something negative. Of course, I'm aware of the fact that this word radical has acquired a certain connotation. We have an entire division of the government that is now set up and has been set up for decades to do surveillance on people that it deems to be radical, uh, generally defined as people who oppose government policies. And uh, in, a, in a real way, 
many of the people that have been oppositional to the injustices here at home have been deemed to be radical. And I find myself very drawn to people who have responded to that surveillance, not by doing that which is easy, which is to say, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not radical. I'm quite moderate. I am not dangerous. I will criticize extremism in my own community, but I don't have a mumbling word to say about the injustices that my own government is committing. And in response to that, there have been people like Dr. King, who used to be called a radical, who used to be called an extremist. I'm sorry to say this morning that I'm absolutely convinced that the forces of ill will in our nation, the extreme rightists of our nation, the people on the wrong side, have used time much more effectively than the forces of goodwill. And it takes him a while, and then at some point he says, well, you know, in the beginning when I would be called a radical, I didn't like it so much. When I would be called an extremist, I didn't like it so much. But wasn't Jesus an extremist in the cause of love? Aren't we called to be extremists in the cause of justice? So he actually turns it around and he embraces that. And, you know, Martin says at one point, and this is an actual quote, so the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremist will we be? Will we be extremists for hate or will we be extremists for love? You speak about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And and I think one of my earliest introductions to your work, Omid, um, and your passion is Dr. King. You know, I've often seen you as 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 one of the kind of the preeminent Muslim voices speaking about, commenting on, interpreting, and making Dr. King relevant. And and I'd love to hear the intersection between these two passions of yours, Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's humbling to realize what a shallow introduction to Dr. King I had growing up. Really, up until 9-11, about the only thing that I really had ever read of Dr. King was the I Have a Dream speech. And, you know, I do remember in the aftermath of 9-11, trying to include a couple of quotes from Dr. King in every talk that I would give about, you know, the moral bankruptcy of violence, which was really a call to say, we're nothing like those terrorists, please don't hurt us. And as time went on, I started to realize that Martin, and I, I like to call him Brother Martin, and I got to see Martin who is showing up for sanitation workers, who is leading the poor people's campaign. And then Martin, after he has won the Nobel Peace Prize, after he has been invited to the White House, after he's overlooked the signing of civil rights legislation, he is pushed and challenged by 18-year-olds in his movement to answer the question, Dr. King, you keep saying that violence is wrong. Why don't you have anything to say about our own government dropping bombs on Vietnam? And that Martin, who was already called America's Black Moses, Mm. he starts to challenge himself and he comes out against the Vietnam War. He says, And so let us stand in this convention knowing that on some positions, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And I think for us as Muslims who are drawn to the path of love and justice, which is really for me the heart of the radical love tradition, if you love the folk, You cannot bear to be silent when you see folks suffering. In 2018, Omid Safi was invited to speak at the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Brother Martin, Dr. King. Crowds turned out on a chilly but sunny day in April to hear him and some of Dr. King's closest living associates, like civil rights leader Jesse Jackson, speak at the National Civil Rights Museum at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. 
I stand before you as an unapologetic Muslim child of Martin. My beloved Prophet Muhammad stands in the same prophetic tradition of love and liberation as Amos, as Jesus of Nazareth, as Brother Martin and Brother Malcolm. That must have been a momentous Martin, moment, but if, if there was a word to describe being there at that moment with Brother Martin's family and those people still surviving who stood with him and, and those who are holding up his legacy, what, what, what might that word be? A prophet is sent to hold a mirror up to society and to remind us that the way we are with the most vulnerable people in our midst is the way that we stand with Allah. That if you want to get a sense of your spiritual well-being, it's not about the amount of wealth that our society is generating. It has to do with the way that the poor, the needy, the orphan, the widow, the refugee, and the babies in cages are faring at the moment. And because profits are so challenging, we've got all these tactics for not taking them seriously. And the last great distraction that we have is to turn them into an icon where you stop once a year and you venerate them instead of actually picking up the mantle and doing the work that has to be done today in the midst of where we are. And I think so, yeah, I was very honored as a Muslim, unapologetic Muslim. And I, you know, um, I started that gathering in the name of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, cited from Rumi, cited from the Prophet Muhammad, brought up Malcolm, but mainly it was a conversation with Brother Martin. That, you know, we're here to say that babies in cages matter. Our black sisters and brothers matter. That poor folk matter. Muslims matter. Refugees matter. Our Hispanic friends on the southern border matter. Jews matter. Gays and lesbians matter. Palestine matters. Ferguson matters. Flint matters. What is this being human to you? There's a wonderful Rumi poem that relates to that. Many of these uh, sages remind us that to be human is fundamentally something that has to do with intimacy. And he says, look at where your own wounds, physical or spiritual, emotional are. Where are we bleeding? And of course, today, it hurts everywhere. But also see the healing. And so I think I'll just end with this. You think you healed all by yourself, but know this, the healing was from the light the wound is where the light enters you. Oh, it's Avi. It's been such a pleasure and it's, uh, it's been heart filling. Thank you for joining me on This Being Human. I thank you. Suleyman, <laughs> Suleyman,